I think we've got, we've got I, I expect we'll probably have people over the next five minutes joining, Andy. I hope that's not going to be too... Um, no, I'll, I'll, I'll continue as is. Brilliant. OK, well, over, over to you, Andy. Right, thank you very much, Richard, and good morning to everyone. Um, by way of introduction, uh, what I'm planning to do today is really a snapshot and no more, uh, at this stage at least, it seems to me that the, the industry, construction, civils and, and related industries are really getting quite desperate for behavioural understanding at a level that is applicable to what they're, to what they're doing. Um, for me, it's quite in, interesting. I did a, an MSc uh, master's degree at um, Leicester University some years ago when I worked in, in aviation and in fact hopefully you can see that, that that human factors and aerospace was where my dissertation was published. And I think that, you know, one of the things that is disturbing but solvable is that um, probably the industry is 30, maybe 40 years behind aviation in terms of understanding the human performance, human behavior and uh, and what goes with that. But nonetheless, that 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 I'll go straight in. That's my introduction. I'll go straight in. It's not my style to read my slides. I think that's really poor performance. Um, but on occasion, I, I'm going to need to highlight particular bits that that uh, that I bring onto screen. But for now, you know, this is what we're talking about was really uh, behavioral science for the layman and. Uh, and my screen is not moving. It is now. Um, so I come from this um, and it's interesting. I post a lot on, on LinkedIn about this sort of stuff and the notion of, you know, working with some of the organizations I work with. It's interesting that they say something happens. They say, well, it's behavioral. And for me, behavior is something to be explained, not something to be used as an explanation. So it's behavioral. And uh, I, I'd like to show how this has tracked through the years. Um, and it really is uh, a notion that was introduced in, in, in the world of aviation, which was the tombstone imperative. And, and as a base of that, the tombstone imperative really uh, is what it says, that when the, the, the deaths, the strikes, the whatever it might be, start stacking up, um, it's imperative that we do something. And I think that the industry as a whole has used the term, we must ensure this never happens again, far too often. And they should be using the term, uh, we must ensure this never happen happens. So there's a need to understand risk on that basis, to reach out into the future and bring it under control. We have the information, we've just got to apply it. Uh, we have the knowledge, we have the experts and skills, and we've just got to apply it. So if I, if I uh, take you through my graph there, you'll see um, the accident rate. Uh, these are just arbitrary figures for, for demonstration. An accident rate towards the top of the graph. Um, and in 1960, 61, things like the Officers, Shops and Railway Premises and Factories Act uh, were out. And they, that legislation demanded hardware solutions because people were getting crushed between vehicles and all that sort of thing. Uh, and, uh, you know, getting caught in machines that didn't have any guard. So the hardware solutions demanded that brakes should be put on machinery, guards and, and all that sort of thing that was hardware related. So you see from there that the, the accident rate fell uh, soon after the introduction, introduction of the legislation. However, that doesn't mean that legis I'm not a big fan of legislation for solving things because it, it's a very, very reactive process. So the, the accident rate fell for a short while whilst it was happening. And it's rather like, you know, keep asking the kids to keep the bedrooms tidy. They'll do it for a while, but then it falls away. And it's a, it's a notion called drifting normality. So after a while, the, uh, the accident rate levels off. Um, when um, the, the measures are no longer being applied. And that was seen as a problem. So as far as 1974, uh, when various things happened, uh, like the Aberfan tip slide and so on, um, things like that said, well, we're going to have to do more. So 1974 demanded 
uh, a system solution. And those systems were um, procedures, risk assessments. Risk assessments in 1974, it was an implied requirement, if not a direct uh, requirement. So risk assessments, procedures, um, controls, that sort of stuff. And um, so again, the accident rate fell a little bit and, uh, and started making its way down and then, as previously, leveled out. In 1990, um, because the accident rate was still uncomfortably high and, and, and therefore the tombstone imperative was still in being, it was, um, it was decided, well, what else can we do now? So in 1990, the, the six pack regulations, I'm sure you remember them well, uh, came in. And again, the legislators said, this will solve it. But like the Officers Shot Railway Premises Act, Factories Act, Health and Safety at Work Act, it didn't solve it. So now we're into the, uh, the um, position of behaviour and how can we get into uh, human behaviour. So if you think about um, the graph, what it's saying there is that hardware solutions and system solutions are all very well, but they re they d depend on the uh, on the individual to apply certain things. And when that behaviour is not um, is not in being, then then we continue having accidents. So so really, this is the final frontier of of what we need to do, and and getting the accidents rate down towards zero if not zero, down towards zero. I have some views on that, uh, but I won't share them for today. But for now, uh, the question exists to say, whereabouts are you on that uh, development line? And, and also leads me into uh, a notion of thought about risk. So I did talk about um, predict, uh, the, the notion of reaching, reaching out into the future to bring it under our control. So, what I'm going to ask you to do now, I've got a, got a question for you, and if you can use your text box to, um, to notify Richard um, of your answer. And the question is very, very simple. Um, and the question is this, wherever you are right here, right now, what is the risk of fire? And you've got options of high, medium and low. So if you can give that some, some thought, what is the risk of fire where you are now, this very moment? Is it high, medium or low? And if you can populate your text box and let Richard know, then uh, we'll, we'll re revisit that in a moment. Have you got any answers coming through, Richard? Yep, yep, got some, got, got some coming through now. OK. okay. Without me um, jumping onto this, but I'm I'm going to suggest, uh, and I, I do this session in all sorts of businesses and boards across the UK, as well as doing it at universities from time to time. And it's my opening gambit to say, what is the risk of fire? Because largely, and I'm not sure what the uh, the data you're getting through there, Richard, says. Largely, people will say it's low. Now that's that's to be understood. There's a, a subliminal reason for that. Very very rarely will people say, "I'm I'm in danger where I am now," because their survival instinct would say, "Well, I'm going to do something about it." Then, so they're quite happy to sit where they are, comfort in the in their own knowledge, right or not, that um, in this instance the risk of fire is low. They think so. So let me give you a little bit of a background towards this. If you think about risk as a, um, a quick and dirty approach here, where you've got likelihood and severity up on one side, uh, this really is a quick and dirty approach. There's a lot more to, to risk management than this, risk assessment than this. And as I said to you, I did uh, risk management at Leicester University. So in 1991, there was a case um, of tangerine confection versus Regina, where uh, an individual, uh, tangerine confectionery, make boiled sweets and, and they're based in Lancashire and they do this with large industrial ovens. The back, backdrop to, to this story was that there was a fatality because an individual accessed an oven um, with a genuine desire to get the job done because they'd had some criticism about hygiene and he accessed an oven without telling anybody and he went in to clean the return ends of the steel conveyors inside. 
Now, of course, you'll appreciate that it has to be steel conveyors and the ovens were something like two inches thick steel um, and they, they rise to a temperature of something like 2000 degrees in the heart of it. And this individual climbed inside and there was a big argument between the, the lawyers uh, about whose fault it was, because obviously this thing gets sort of very punitive. And and the argument took the um, the legal meaning into what is reasonably foreseeable. Now, it is uh, it went further and it became what is the reasonably foreseeable worst case. So in that instance, it was it was decided that it was foreseeable that with the pressure on about hygiene standards, individuals would probably it, it was foreseeable that they would try to do something to to lift the hygiene standards and therefore it was foreseeable that someone may climb in to an oven to go and clean and not let anybody know uh, which is what happened in, in this instance and the uh, the access door was mistakenly closed and locked shut which allows the the oven to uh, to start and the conveyor to start and and the outcome I guess you can use your imagination on that. So the point about this is that the severity is now based on reasonably foreseeable worst case. So if we look at risk in that context, then that you'll see that on the uh, the top right there, you've got um, severity, uh, high severity is typically six and nine on this three by three scale. As I say, I'm using it quick and dirty for the um, for the for the demonstration today. Similarly, um, you know, the one and two falls into low risk and through the center there, uh, three, three and four into the medium. So I am guessing without getting too um, investigative on this, that Richard, you've probably got an awful lot of lows. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I, I find that wherever I go. Now, the thing is this. Um, I ask, what is the risk of fire? Wherever you are, the um, the reasonably foreseeable worst case of a fire. If you're in the office, the potential is that uh, it's foreseeable that the office could burn to the ground. I'm not saying it would. And don't get me wrong here. I'm not one of these safety professionals that says you're all going to die. You're all going to go to prison. You know what naughty boys we are. Um, but the point is, it is foreseeable that if there's a fire in a building, it'll, it, it could burn to the ground and you would have a very hard job um, arguing in court that that is not foreseeable because Grenfell Tower and Bradford City Football Ground are evidence that, that these sorts of things do happen. Similarly, if you're at home, then a fire in the home can be severely damaging to the home. You might lose your home. And, and, and in any case, um, whether it's home or... Um, or in the workplace, there are t fatalities associated with fires. Now, that is entirely foreseeable and entirely reasonable, and you would have a difficult job arguing to the contrary. So the point is this. If you said, the, um, the in answer to my question, the risk of fire is low, then you guessed, and with the greatest respect to you, you guessed and you guessed wrong. And the, uh, of course, the problem with with this is that, uh, and I'll, I'll move on a little bit. And this is part of, you know, the notion of behavioral science, where Carl Jung is saying, well, people think, oh, that's the answer, and then they go to go with it. Uh, the thought appeared to them, and they don't uh, elaborate on that or or think it through particularly. Now, what's happened here is that I asked, what is the risk of fire? You have answered as though I asked, what is the likelihood of fire? Well, the likelihood where you are is probably very low because of the measures you take. So you see this sort of um, societal view of um, of risk. Um, I took a photograph some time ago of this site, risk of skidding, when actually it's a likelihood of skidding. But it's quite normal for people when asked about a question in the context of risk to answer as though they're being asked about likelihood. Well, these are two independent variables. And uh, for anybody that knows anything about statistics, you'll know why they're independent. And um, and that's for another time. And the the notion is that when I ask a question about uh, what is the risk of fire, you answer as though I've said, what is the likelihood of fire? 
because the, the modern vernacular is that risk is likelihood. You see this with what's going on in the world at the moment. They talk about the risk of coronavirus. Well, it's actually the likelihood of coronavirus. So, uh, but there's a bigger question here. Um, when I asked what is the risk of fire, and for those of you who, who said anything but high, this is the question. What did it feel like when you were wrong? OK, so if you sub subject that to a little thought at the moment and um, the, the answer to that question is this with a little bit of an explanation. What did it feel like when you were wrong? Well, it felt like you were right because you didn't subject your thoughts to criticism, elaboration or amplification. Now, if you take that a, a little stage further and think about your guys that are going out on sites and breaking ground, so they're having the same discussion, uh, you know, in the cab of a flatback, ready to get the um, the machinery off the back there and the, the cat and Jenny, if they indeed take the Jenny with them. Um, so, you know, they're saying, oh, yeah, we'll be OK with this. We'll be able to break the ground here, you know, low risk. Well, the question is to them as well. What did it feel like when they were wrong? And indeed, it felt like they were right, as it did to you. So this is the notion of understanding risk. Uh, um, at its uh, at its base level and being able to apply that and the amount of organizations that I've consulted for on on behavioral science behavioral safety have always said well our guys you know we ask them to think about the risk well I put this to you that I'm a, I ask you to think about risk and with the greatest respect I would say the majority guessed and guessed wrong now if we're doing that in this no pressured environment uh, nice and comfortable, then what's happening out on sites when um, and in the roadways and the highways when the guys have a job to do in a certain time, whether it's um, repair or, or whether it's installation, whatever it might be, what is the risk of fire? So let me go further into into the human, uh, typical human behavior. I'm going to put something on, up on screen now uh, for about five seconds. And if you have a pen and paper and if not, commit it to memory. Uh, I want you to, uh, to have a look and see what that says. Now, I've taken it off screen now. And again, I'll pretty much bet my car that, um, and it's a nice car, that um, you've written down or you've committed to memory a walk in the forest. OK, that's reasonable. However, let me pull the slide up again and read it again. It doesn't say a walk in the forest. It says a walk in the, the forest because what you were reasonably expecting didn't happen. And if you apply this thinking to what happens on the ground, what the guys are reasonably expecting with the run of a service doesn't always happen. So let's go a little bit further on, on, on the human frailty. Now, you can take your pen top or your fingers or whatever you wish to do now and, and measure these. But at first view, which table side is the longest? OK, so if you, you take a moment to put your pen top or your finger there and, and measure and then then you will realize that the uh, the left hand side vertical of the narrow table is exactly the same size as the uh, horizontal of the the uh, the shorter broader table on the right hand side. So you can see that now and you know that now. OK, so now that you know it, which one is the longest? And I guess you're looking at that thinking, well, I'm still in the same space. And that is it, it's not so easy for for us to say, well, you should think about this and they should have seen it and so on, because that's not what the, the human does. What the human does do is uh, have a a real, a real sense of security on, on being able to ignore what we don't know and, and make sense of things that, that aren't really there or, or ignore things that are really there. So you'll be able to read that, I'm sure. So I'll go into some more questions now. And here's a, um, a question for you and one that I've applied in many, many uh, organizations doing behavioral safety for them or or many boardrooms, which has always been interesting, is the question is, how's your driving? Would you say you're a reasonable motorist? And I guess your um, your response to that would be, yeah, I think I'm a reasonable motorist, Andy. So, OK, 
let me put some questions to you and apply this to the people that are going on our sites and the people that are working on our highways. And they're just like us, they're just like me, we're all the same in that way. Um, so when I talk about the people that are doing this and doing that, it is me. I'm talking about me and I am talking about you. Okay, so do you ever go above 30 in a 30 zone? Now, I will get all sorts of different answers to these when, this when I'm speaking face to face. Um, and people will say, oh, well, I do, Andy, from time to time, but I don't mean to. The question is a simple yes or no. Do you ever go above 30 in a 30 zone? When you're on the motorway, do you ever drift above 70? And, uh, and therefore, you know, if you're honest to yourself here, uh, we've established one thing probably already, that from time to time you break the rules. And here's another question. What is the stopping distance at 70 miles an hour? Now, um, for me, the question really is, do you know what is the stopping distance at 70 miles an hour? And really, I'm presuming that most people on this call drive every day, so they should be familiar with the, the highway code, which is the code about driving. It's the rules and procedures of driving, like we have the rules of proce and procedures for breaking ground. And, and we say, well, they should know, they, they, sh they know what to do, but they didn't do it. And that's one of the common things, you know, in human behavior. They knew what to do, but just didn't do it. So um, you know what to do, you, um, you, what, you know what the stopping distance is, or maybe you don't, but it's 315 feet for those of you who were interested to know at 70 miles an hour. So, but we've, we've established two things. I've asked two questions and we've established two things already, I suggest. Now, you may well be banging the table at your end of this point saying, well, actually, Andy, I do know that. And if you do, that's great, but, but go with the flow here. Um, how's your uh, understanding of risk? Well, I think already, given what uh, Richard has reported back and my questions on that, and, and what I found in my experience is that the vast majority of people um, misperceive risk or, or misjudge the magnitude of risk and uh, they because they don't model consequences very well and they don't make that uh, difference between what is the likelihood and what is the severity so three questions already and i've established three things um about us on this call here that is that we break the rules we don't know the rules and we misperceive the risk so um here's a scenario um you're driving along the uh, the road and uh, there's a fracas at the side. I mean, there's a notion that that um, that covers this, and it's it's sort of it's, people talk about it as, as as rubbernecking. And you know that when there's been a, a smash on the uh, adjacent carriageway, that people slow down. So from time to time, people are inattentive. It's me, it's you, it's everybody else in the world. Okay, and. Uh, also, we, we know that if, if, you know, you have a text come through on your phone whilst you're driving, there is a temptation to have a look at the screen of your car if your car allows you to do that, or maybe even, even have a look down. Now, I know lots of people will say, well, I, I absolutely don't do that, Andy. And that's great. They don't. But uh, some people do. And there's any number of examples of people, you know, with the kids in the back of the car shouting and screaming he's hit me and, and, and that sort of thing, where we take our eye off the road, even to, to put a new, new um, disc in the car or, or USB stick in or change the radio program, whatever it might be. From time to time, we are a little bit uh, inattentive and certainly from time to time, we are careless. Uh, more than that, imagine that uh, you are um, in a run of traffic doing maybe five, eight miles an hour, very, very slow, and there's a car willing to come out of, uh, wanting to come out of a side street. And my question is this, do you always let that car out or do you have criteria? Um, that criteria might include, well, it's a heavy lorry that's going to slow you down anyway, uh, or, or it's a taxi and you don't let them out because you don't like them anyway. Um, but whichever scenario we might develop, from time to time, you are perhaps a little bit inconsiderate. Um, and, and latterly, the highway code uh, says before every journey uh, you embark upon, 
you should check your tire pressures and the condition of the walls of your tires. Now, again, I will get the rationalization from people when I'm or in talking about this to say, well, my car does it for me anyway. Well, the highway code doesn't say brackets unless your car does it for you. It says you should check the conditions of your tires before every journey. So it's also true to say that uh, maybe we fail to check. But the, the, the wider point here is that, you know, I asked some simple questions here about your driving. And this is a task you undertake probably every day. And you'll see there that as a, as a human approach, it, it's very, very flawed uh, with, with all the things that we do. Now, if I go back to my opening gambit, which is it's behavioural, behavioral, I talked to a, uh, a tier one con contractor re recently and their safety manager who, to be fair, uh, I don't expect all safety managers to be behavioural scientists, but their safety manager, to be fair, um, um, should have known better because he said, well, the problem is, and this was at a... Um, sort of conference stand down day and he was barking at the 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 guys in attendance saying you know you've got to change your attitude so the question then is begged is this about attitude or is it about behavior so let me try and give you a brief explanation on that um the human operates on a notion of uh, homeostasis and that is a latin uh, phrase for same state we liked how our attitude and our behavior to be in balance otherwise we suffer from a notion of that's called cognitive dissonance so take for example um seat belts back in the uh mid to late 80s when seat belt legislation was being developed and, and coming out for those of you like me that are old enough to remember um there was quite a ferrari where individuals were saying i'm not going to wear a, a seat belt and uh, rationalization to say this is developing into a nanny state. <laughs> if I want to go through the windscreen, I will. <laughs> and it was very much, you know, so that sort of rationalization, even to the point where there was a knitwear manufacturer. You'll probably find this on the on the Internet. A knitwear manufacturer in Leicester who were, were making sweaters, jerseys, jumpers, call them what you will, with a diagonal black band across them. So it looked as though you had a seatbelt on. And this was the introduction of the, the um, on the spot fine process. So getting back to what is it attitude or behavior then? So we, we, um, we are always told change your attitude. And this is what happened at the, the stand down day that I, I spoke at recently. And um, so the going back to the seatbelts, what actually happened with the uh, behavioral scientists uh, in its uh, embryotic stages as it was then, recognized that uh, what we have to do is, is change behavior. So those people um, that were saying, I'm not willing to put on a seatbelt, uh, there was an assault on their sensors from um, the Department of Transport and the uh, Transport Research Laboratory, which was in Reading at the time, I don't know if it still is, uh, where all sorts of information was put out on on television adverts. You'll remember the Jimmy Savile thing, think, um, clunk click every trip, and uh, and in schools where where children who then could be shown graphic images of car crashes and with the the rather brutal message to them that, to say well look when mummy and daddy get in the car you you uh, you need to tell them to put their seat belt on uh or you may not have a mum and mummy and daddy anymore so it's rather brutal um but the the underlying point was that we have to change behavior and so over a period of time when um children were saying to mum and dad you've got to put your seat belt on and it was constantly uh, pushed at them from television adverts and and poster campaigns. Um, wear your seatbelt, wear your seatbelt. So and and obviously there was this um, further enforcement of penalty points and on the spot fines. So when when people were getting in their cars, they were doing the clunk click, and it started to happen. Now over a period of time. Um, 
as that happened, these these are the same people who were saying, I I, I have no desire to wear a seatbelt and I'm not going to do it and, and putting up all the rationalizations that they wish to put up for that. So uh, but over a period of time, when they were behaving in that certain way, because, I, as I mentioned, the notion of homeostasis, the attitude and behavior have to be um, in alignment. Otherwise, there's cognitive dissonance. So so that they're attitude came came with it so so the behavior was i put my seatbelt on the attitude was well yeah i have to because it saves me and uh, you know i don't want to go through the windscreen and i don't want to end up in a wheelchair or whatever else they rationalize on the other side but but the wider point is that um the the behavioral change must come first and the attitude will follow so my um uh lamenting at the stand, stand down day uh, with the safety manager who was barking the you've got to change your attitude you lot out there you know i, I uh, we had the conversation thereafter but anyway so the the point the wider point is that the the attitude uh comes after the change in behavior so we have to get into the behavioral change and there are various strategies we can use that and make no mistake this is very very doable so let's take a a, a closer look at the human system So um, the, the, the five block arrows there represent the five senses uh, of, of the human. And, and those sensors go into uh, what's best described as a, as a filter. Uh, that filter that we have in our brains is, the, is an attention mechanism. So it detects everything that is coming in. And, and, but it only lets through what you're interested in to get into your perception mechanism and uh, there's lots of uh, competing sensors but things that you don't want to get through do not get through say for example um at the moment you know there's a there's a um a buzzing in the background or or um, something else is happening outside the room or or in the office then these are comp competing sensors but at the moment only the things, the, the only thing that's getting through potentially is what Andy is saying, because nothing else is competing at, at that level, he says in a rather conceited way. It wasn't intended to be like that. Um, so information goes into the filter. Um, some of it gets through. But what gets through is what we are interested in or what that filter has been tuned for. And I'll give you an example of that. I was um, in the car uh, some time ago and it was transfer deadline day with the football and i've got talk sport on and my wife has sat at the side of me and we're driving along and we're chatting away and full conversation that, and then all of a sudden i turn to her and i say just please be quiet a minute and she asks why because i've abruptly stopped the conversation and the reason i've abruptly stopped the conversation is because something happened in the background on the radio which said interesting transfer news from the city ground nottingham forest and i heard that she didn't hear it because her filter would you believe incredibly is not tuned to nottingham forest whereas mine is so i heard that and this might be further explained as the cocktail party phenomena you know if you're standing in a uh, in a lounge of maybe 20 people or or whatever the number might be at a cocktail party and somebody is talking away and they then mention Andy Shaw. Well, I, I then at that point, my ears cock up because my filter is tuned to my name. So you hear what the filter is tuned towards. And that filter can be tuned to safety. It can be tuned to production. A further example of this is that um, uh, when I worked in, in aviation, it was all very much flights on time, flights on time, flights on time. So I remember uh, going out onto the uh, onto the airfield to help the baggage handlers because I like to get among what's happening, to listen, to see what what is happening, and to listen what what is being said about various things, to to see how how human behaviour is is developing in in whatever ever area I'm working in, and um, so the guys had unloaded a um, an arriving aircraft and and after they'd done that and and uh, got the passengers off the airplane and through to the terminal 
uh, via the the the, uh, the bus transportation. Um, they went back into the crew room, and the um, the duty manager there. I remember going in with the guys and, and sitting at the back listening, and the duty manager there, there said, "Right, guys, did you uh, did you get the bags off on time? Yes." Did you uh, get the passengers uh, disembarked on time? Yes. Did you get them on the coaches on time? Yes. Did you get them into the terminal on time? Have they passed through on time? Yes. Right, now we've got the Edinburgh flight to load up uh, ready for, for, for departure. So if you can go out and do that, and please remember, safety is our number one priority. Now, of course, their filter at that point is tuned not to the throwaway, throwaway line of safety is our number one priority. It is tuned to production, flights on time is our number one priority. And I argue that that's similar in, in, uh, in the industry of construction and civils. So information passes through the filter, only what we, we are interested in or what we have been tuned, uh, that filter has been tuned to allow through, gets into the perception mechanism. So we perceive what, what happens and then we decide what to do. For those of you that remember the um, Think Once, Think Twice, Think Bike advert, that we, we were bombarded on television by uh, accident footage and uh, where there's a gentleman, um, a person, I can't remember the gender, it doesn't matter, a person at a T-junction in a car looking to, to pull out. Now, in the distance, there was a motorbike, and it shows the motorbike um, hastily making its way towards the T-junction and the driver pulling out. So it's quite graphic to start with that, that there's a sort of T-bone ac accident, and, and it went on from there, and the advert was to say, think once, think twice, think bike. And, and, and the point was, when bikes are uh, a long way away, because they're so small and often so fast moving, you have to really be careful about what you do. And so the filter was tuned to bike safety. Therefore, the perception was about bike safety. Therefore, the decision is, shall I pull out? And this is the, at what point do I act? The decision is to, to act. So shall I pull out um, because the bike's so far away? Or shall I stay where I am? And, and whichever way you go on that, it's either safe or unsafe. So that filter can be tuned. And I am mindful of, of time. As I said, there's a lot of information here. That filter is tuned. This is a picture um, for anybody that's been to see Warhorse at the theatre in London. Um, we, um, my wife and I went down to see this. And you'll know that these horses are puppets with puppeteers on stage. And uh, my wife said to me... Um, I'm not, this is at the interval. She said, I'm not enjoying this um, because, you know, I can just see the puppeteers all the time. And I said, well, don't worry because they will go away because her filter is being tuned into the horse and therefore anything else that's competing with that will just fall away. It's a bit like when you're watching a film with um, subtitles, you know, you're so annoyed that the subtitles are on, but after a, a short while, you don't even notice the subtitles subtitles because other things are competing with your filter so the wider message on this is that the um the filter can be tuned and, and therefore we can tune the filter to think purely about safety rather than other things to allow the decisions to be made that that we want of course the perception mechanism is uh, is impacted by things like fatigue stress drugs alcohol all that type of stuff but we can uh, have a, a lightning bolt that breaks through all of that and straight into the action, and therefore the action is to safety. And uh, so we tune the filter to make sure we get safe acts all of the time, and it really is doable. So if I move a, a little bit forward, uh, and uh, and this is really interesting to me as a behavioral scientist, that um, all we know about the world, not all we know, a lot of what we know about the world is that you know, we have a uh, tremendous um, ability to ignore what, what's really happening and be secure in that. Um, and this, this is an example that demonstrates that. If I said to you, well, tell me about the driver. If I go into a punitive organisation, a one that is a, he's made a mistake, so sack him, 
that type of organization, which I'm sure you know the types that exist and, and, and the, uh, the nefarious culture uh, and pernicious culture that, that's in there. Um, so I tell me about the driver. Well, the point is about this with the driver. It's, it's me and it's you. So the, um, the, the point about this particular investigation was the driver was used to driving a single decker bus. He wasn't used to that route. Um, on, his, uh, on his bus on this occasion were more school children than normal. And therefore, everything was competing with his filter uh, that affected his decision making, if we go uh, talk about what I was uh, mentioning on the previous slide. So, you know, this sort of takes us into what happens when there are accidents. Uh, and you, you get that from, a, from the occasional manager. Of course, nobody on this call, but take more care out there, you know, and there's the undertone of, you know, you idiot. But there's some more things to consider here is that, you know, people wouldn't have accidents if it was easy to be safe. There's this notion, applicable notion of what is safe enough. And people will make their own judgments on that unless we can affect their filter. Um, when you drive on the motorway and you're doing 85 and even though, you know, it's 70, you're doing that because, you know, it's safe enough. Um, when you then start feeling a little bit dis uh, of discomfort for whatever reason, maybe it's the consequences of uh, of of a speeding fine or, or other things that get into your psyche, then uh, then you know you'll change your behaviour. But up until that point, it is safe enough. So if if for example, this is why people change light bul bulbs on chairs. Now I have no great problem with that. I, I don't wrap the world in cotton wool, um, you know, but achieve good safety outcomes. So. You know, I guess that would be jumped upon by people saying, well, you should use the proper tools. And I get all of that. But to climb on a chair for five seconds to change a light bulb is safe enough. And we make that decision. It's safe enough. And also it's convenient as well. And people will always do what is convenient. So rather than go into the storeroom to get the little trestle or, or ladders uh, steps, they will do what they consider to be safe enough. So we have to open eyes to possibilities about what might happen because people's views are very, very deep seated. Um, now, we also know in our industry that, that the strikes and Richard and I were talking about this before the call started about the number of strikes we have per annum and um, we can explain them all. So it is possible, therefore, to um, to reach out into the future. And, and bring things under the control, under our control, with a notion of predict and prevent. I want to go more though, um, and this is really about how the industry thinks about safety. So, for example, we seem to be obsessed as an industry with lagging indicators. We we report what's happened rather than what's happening, and there is a problem for those of you that follow me on LinkedIn and my regular postings there. You know, I've I've long lamented the issue of lagging indicators versus leading indicators. Um, the uh, the the propensity of the industry to talk about what's happened rather than talk about what's happening, and this is de damaging organisations' ability to win new contracts. And those that do win new contracts, uh, some of them are. This is a little controversial, but but of course I wouldn't mention them. But some of them I know don't have redors, they don't have strikes, according to their figures, but they actually do. So they put a lot of effort into, into uh, making sure the data uh, is, is manipulated rather than the, uh, the methodologies to, to avoid strikes and various other things are put into place. So going back to the, the notion of accidents, and this is the um, International Safety Rating System definition of an accident, which is an unplanned and uncontrolled event. But you'll notice that a combination of the unsafe act and the unsafe condition resulting in loss or the potential for loss. So this potential for loss is what the aviation industry calls a free lesson. Our industry calls them close calls or, or anything else, that, you know, a near miss, uh, any other um, type of um, expression you wish to use. But, but the, indus the aviation industry use, use the term free lessons and 
builds their culture on such that we've had a lesson here that didn't cost us anything and therefore it's free so we're going to learn from it so if you think about the the industry's desire our industry's desire to um to use triangle triangles triangles are not a predictor if they were then these numbers would move in uh, in unison all of the time but as an industry we seem to concentrate on the the red numbers uh, lost time, you know, first aid, that sort of thing, and um, and as you know from the theory of, of relative density, that um, if you chop a bit off the top of the the iceberg, then then it lifts. So to to concentrate on the ones at the top is to concentrate on completely the wrong thing. If we, however, concentrate down at the bottom, then um, we drop the iceberg further into the water and, and remove the tip. So all the answers that we need are in our free lessons. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, it is safe to say that this is a tremendous industry failing uh, that we concentrate on the wrong thing. And we are concentrating on the wrong thing. And as you know, um, other wrong things involve there's been an accident. So what happens? We put in a new rule or a new procedure to prevent what has happened from happening. And it, as I said in my opening gambit, it's, it's rather, rather reactive. So you think about this, this notion of putting further rules in place. Now, this is, I am going to talk through each one in turn. So let me rationalize. I, I, I'm working on, on the highways or, or on a site. Let me rationalize. Rules, that there's a, body, a huge body of rules, and we know that most rules... Uh, there's a there is a body or an injury or or whatever it might be behind every one, and I know of a major uh, client who um, who have life saving rules, and those life saving rules, strangely enough, there isn't a life saving rule for confined space entry, and I asked the question why, and the response I had was, well, because nobody's died that way yet. So we'll wait for it to happen and then we'll do something about it. Now, I don't know about you, that, that, I find that really jarring on the soul. So they're there to be broken. They're only there if you don't know what you're doing. Uh, there is disciplinary inconsistency with, with rules. Um, everyone else does it, don't they? Um, there are no con consequences for not following the rules. Uh, of course, you know, there are consequences if there's an accident. So so if if you don't get the Jenny off the back of the van and everything works out fine, then everybody's happy. If you don't get the Jenny off the back of the van and we strike a cable, then then there are consequences. And and this um, this to me seems to be an industry problem. Management does not care about us following the rules until someone is hurt. I'm not sure that's necessarily true, but these are some of the rationalizations I've uh, I've heard on sites from from my many, many years in the industry as a behavioral scientist. Uh, we I never have and never will get hurt. And, and this is uh, the denial of what what can happen. And I mentioned a few minutes ago about, um, you know, people just uh, opening eyes to possibilities. I was doing a session on risk management uh, recently um, and I was talking about things that may happen and, and the response I had was, well, that's never happened before. Yeah. And, do you know, um, Concorde never crashed before it crashed. Grenfell Tower never burnt down before it burnt down. So to, to apply that rationale, so I'm Andy. And I am, I am never going to get killed in a car accident because I haven't been. And it, it's that sort of approach. So, you know, it won't happen because it never will. Well, again, we have to reach out into the future and bring it under our control. So the rules are there to protect the management. Um, I can't be expected to remember them all. They slow the job down. These are all the rationalizations not to apply the rules. However, think about this one. When do we get the application of the rule? And this used to be a very 1970s thing that says, well, we will work to, if you don't give us what we want, we will work to rule. See how you like that. Yeah, we'll follow all the rules to punish you. And, and it's quite a turnaround, really, because now um, 
you know, managers were balking at that in the in the 70s, uh, you know, in, in the sort of industrial time of, of National Coal Board and that sort of thing. Well, we'll go on strike or, or we'll work to the rules, see how you like that. Whereas now it's about it's an about turnaround saying, well, rules are important. We want you to follow them. But we've got all the rationales that go with it. You can draw from uh, your conclusions from that anyway. But it sort of takes me into the uh, the next bit, really, which is it, it is very unfortunate that um, changes in safety are on the back of loss. All the um, the improvements to me seem to be on the back uh, of someone dying. So so therefore the legislation is written in someone's blood and again that makes for me very uncomfortable feeling rules yeah uh the, there's a notion of rule violation as well and rule violations come in three forms and they are routine they are situational or they are exceptional and let me briefly explain those routine violations are the things you're going to do today when you drive your car and you go above 30 miles an hour in the 30 zone you do that routinely and, you know, you can do that routinely because very, very rarely does anything happen. I know people that routinely violate 30 miles an hour. I'm one of them without points on the license. And I'm one of them. So the other side of this is, is the situational violation. We find ourselves in a certain situation. The, uh, the, the van is parked 50 yards away from, from site. The Jenny is on the back of the van, so it is um, not convenient for me to to go back to the van to get the Jenny. Now, you can moralize over people that do that. But let me tell you, the people that do that are me and you and the guys that are, are breaking ground. So that's a situational violation. I'll give you a further example of this. Many, many years ago, um, I was um, doing some decoration at home and uh, my wife said to me that she was popping into town and would, um, you know, do you think you'll have made a start, Andy, on, on the, the motioning of the walls? And um, so I got the message and I said, yeah, I should imagine. So so when she when when uh, she popped into town, I thought, well, I'll, I'll get cracking here. And uh, so anyway, I'd done everything that I needed to do. Um, the walls were ready. One thing that I hadn't done, though, was, was taken the, uh, the plug sockets off the wall and I, and I wanted to be able to, to emulsion the walls. So I looked for my screwdriver and couldn't find it. I went in the drawer, you know, the drawer that's got the bit, bit of blue tack, the old Yale key that you don't know what it's for and a marble. And I thought there'll be a screwdriver in there, but there wasn't. So anyway, I, I thought, well, time's getting short. So what I'm going to have to do here is... Um, is use a knife but i can't use a knife because you know she'll know and uh, so i jump in the car and i drive across to my dad's and and he was a master craftsman uh, in in his uh his tool making air area and so i get there and say to dad can i borrow a screwdriver so we go through this whole process of what do you want a screwdriver for and what sort of screw screwdriver do you want and he goes through this process of being very secretive because his tools are very, very important to him. And uh, he saves them in tissue paper laid on cotton wool. It's that sort of thing in a box that's secreted away in the garage. So eventually he comes out with a, with a screwdriver, a long handled, a long uh, flat handle screwdriver. So I take it home. I take off the, um, the sockets, keeping an eye on time, bearing in mind I've got this, there's something invading my filter. Uh, and my filter is tuned to time because my wife has said, well, I, I'm going into town, but I won't be long. So I, having taken off all the sockets, I am now in a situation where I, I open up the, uh, the tin of emulsion and I need a stick to stir that tin of, of emulsion. But I don't have one to hand. What I do have to hand is a screwdriver. It doesn't belong to me. And it's came wrapped in tissue paper and it's been very well looked after over the years. But my situation means that I'm going to have to do it. I'm going to have to stare the the, uh, the paint with the screwdriver. I know it's wrong, but that's the situation I'm in. So I guess you grasp that notion of the situational violation. The exceptional violation is one where I find myself in exceptional circumstances, like um, when little Johnny wanders onto the uh, underground railway lines and mum or dad jump onto the track 
to, uh, to, to get him out of there. Uh, so they know what not to do, but they do it anyway because their circumstances are exceptional. So if we go a little bit further then, um, most accidents arise from a uh, most um, accidents arise from a genuine desire to get the job done and therefore people will violate to get the job done. They know that um, if the job is not done, then there are consequences for that if there's been an accident along the way. Uh, where, however, if the job is done, and I put a little cash till register there because that signifies the money is coming in. If the job is done, then there's a reward for that, regardless of how it's been done in many cases. So, and as I said earlier on, violations become routine because they result in success, most of them. Most times you violate, it turns out fine, hence going over 30 miles an hour. Now, I'm very mindful of time here, but let's just see if I can get to a point where this is how ac accidents happen. As you can see that, there's a, this developing accident chain, which is known as the, the domino theory. Now, what we have in, with the, uh, the center domino there is the hazards. Hazards are conditions or practices, practices being the human side, uh, with a potential for loss. Now, I mentioned earlier on about the, um, the accident definition, which is, you know, the, uh, the unplanned event uh, un uh, caused by the combination of the unsafe act and the unsafe condition. So the unsafe act is absolutely key. The unsafe condition is key too, and it's easier to deal with conditions than it is with actions. But the hazard, this is how the, the accident chain plays out. Uh, there's a lack of control and then over they go and eventually you get the injury. But what we can do is um, if we can remove the hazard, as you can see there, uh, and then whatever happens before, we never get the accident. And, it, and for me, it's interesting that... Um, you know, when I uh, looked into the Challenger Space Shuttle inquiry, NASA said that they got a perfect safety record until that happened. They'd never had an accident before. Well, actually, they had. They just didn't recognize it as an accident. So with this sort of thing, we get into predict and prevent. And, uh, and I asked the question, and on stand down days, I've always done this in, in involving the guys and saying to them, what's going to be the next accident and the thing is they will tell you often you see on stand down days in my experience is that we show accident data and we talk about accidents that have happened but we don't talk about we don't ask the guys who are doing the job what's going to be the next accident and they will know so it's incumbent upon us to predict and prevent and uh, we can get all that information in our knowledge bank and apply it because it's fair to say that much of, of what happens uh, has been happening for a long time. And, and most of, of what, uh, what happened in any accident is, is what happens generally. So um, there's also a pervasive view in the industry that we there's an accident and they send out a safety alert. But for those of you who know about multiple causation, will understand that safety alerts are um, are impotent, really, because the accident that that they're they're telling us about will probably never be never repeated because it's a uh, multiple causation. Richard, I've just got a bit of feedback on my line there; it's gone away, and I'm also mindful of the time, so I'm going to go for two or three more minutes if that's okay. Um, so the other thing here, and this is a, a real concern of mine is the absence of po positive reinforcement. We've got an industry where we're quick to, I think, jump on individuals who aren't doing the right thing, but not so quick to jump on individuals uh, for doing the right thing. And I'll give you, I think, one of my best examples of um, positive reinforcement uh, and, and, the, and also the negative side. I was on a, a rail site in Derbyshire uh, a few years ago and I'd actually gone to uh, to talk to the group about behavioral science. And as I walked into the cabin, I got rather a, uh, a difficult character. So, uh, you know, I introduced myself and he said, ah, the behavioral scientist that's going to tell us all how to be safe. Is that right? And I said, no, that's not right. But I think I can help you. And anyway, we walked out onto site together. And as we walked out the door, a guy was was cutting some some curbing with a still saw. And he didn't have his protective eyewear on. 
he um, he saw us coming. Of course, he he dropped down his still still saw. He quickly wrestled with his pocket to get out his glasses and put them on. And both myself and the the site manager saw that, and I felt the site manager's pace quicken because he was easy to lamb. He was easy into into a mindset of I'm going to lambast this guy. Let him know who's in charge and what he's doing wrong. So I sort of took him by the forearm and said, Colin, slow. Uh, let me deal with this. And uh, so I went over to the guy and uh, sort of squatted down at the side of him. And I said, look, you know, I'm Andy. Uh, I'm working as a behavioral, an independent behavioral scientist and risk manager for this business. I, I've seen what's happened. I just want to talk to you about it. And that's all that's going to happen. So he took some comfort in that, that he wasn't facing the sack or whatever punitive measures uh, could have come his way. So I said to him, all I want to know is, why should you wear those, uh, wear that protective eyewear? And he started to tell me, okay. And so I was, I was really pleased with that. He was telling me about his his wife, and he was telling me about his children and his daughter, who was a, uh, you know, a budding pianist, that sort of stuff. And uh, you know, he he told me, so yeah, I need to look after my eyes. I want to see all of that. And you know, for me, that was enough. I never told him what to do. He told me what he should have done. Now. When I did uh, my master's in risk, I studied Alcoholics Anonymous and I, I went to one of their meetings, not because I needed to, but because I wanted to study to why, why they did what they did. And you'll know that at Alcoholics Anonymous, people go in voluntarily and they sit there and they say, hello, my name is Andy and I'm an alcoholic. And um, they are then malleable to change. Once they've told you what the problem is, they're malleable to change. And essentially, they're saying, hello, my name is Andy. I'm an alcoholic and I want you to help me. And therefore, we can offer the help. So when I spoke to this guy on site, knelt down with him to say, tell me what happened, uh, why, why you did what you did. And he basically said, hello, my name is Fred or whatever his name was. And, and, and I don't use my eyewear. Um, you know, and I said, well, tell me why you do that then. Fred, and why you should do that. Why do you want to stop drinking, in essence? And, and he told me why. So he, at that point, he's malleable to change. Now, the very interesting thing about this is that um, I um, started walking away with the site manager, and I felt him slow to a point of stop and then spin around. And he, he, he headed back to the guy, Fred, or whatever his name was, and said, Fred, don't let me catch you doing that again. And, and then he turned around and, and came back up to the side of me. And I looked at him and I said, Colin, he won't. He'll do it again, but he won't let you catch him. So this is the thing about the, the notion of positive reinforcement is that we, we've got to use positive reinforcement rather than negative reinforcement because we want to deal with what is happening rather than what has happened. Um. Richard, I think I've probably got 10 minutes material, so I'm going to call a stop to, to this at this point. And if anybody wants any more, they can always get, in, always touch, get in touch, touch, with, touch me with me and, and um, or we can put on another back end session uh, because I don't want to run over. I know people have got things to do. Yeah, no, that's perfect, Andy. Thank you very much. I think um, I think we might have lost 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 a few um, just, you, you know, what it's like with the, uh, the, of the, course, the, I understand, the current yeah. timings and things. So, but found that really interesting. I don't know if anyone that's left on the call has got any questions. Um, very happy to, I'm sure Andy's very happy to take them. Uh, I think that sort of filter that, you know, looking at the the, the mind and, and, and what happens um, is, is really interesting and, and I'm sure lots for people to learn from. So is it, has anyone got any questions for Andy? Um, any burning questions there? I don't think so. I don't know. Lovely. Okay. Well, um, I think if anyone's got any feedback um, for Andy, I know Andy, you, I'm sure you're happy if we share your details. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Perfect. Perfect. So, well, I think that's 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 been fantastic, Andy. And um, I just want to say thank you very much for such a. I know it's it's really hard. I'm sure that there's probably, you know, a, a two or three hour slot isn't going to cover this. Isn't, isn't going to cover this. Never mind a sort of a, an hour on, on a Thursday morning. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's 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 so much we haven't been able to cover in that time. But as a sort of introduction, it's been it's been really interesting. Thank you very much, Richard. I'd be delighted to come back and do more should people want it.
Perfect. No, that's great. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I think we'll probably draw it to a close there. Um, the the next session we have is on Thursday the 8th of April, I believe, uh, and that's with open reach um, and working around high pressure pipelines. Um, and as ever, if there's any feedback, please do come back to us and we're very happy to hear any feedback as well as provi providing Andy's details um, for, for follow ups. So, yeah, thank you very much. Enjoy, enjoy the rest of the morning, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye now. Thank Thanks, you. Andy. Thanks, Andy. Bye-bye. Thanks, Andy. Bye. Bye. Bye.